Hi there, welcome to this warm up review. Let's get started. First question Which enzyme is deficient in each of the following diseases? So, first, fructose intolerance is aldolase B, essential fructosuria is fructokinase deficiency, and classic galactosemia is a galactose 1 phosphate uridyl transferase deficiency. Next question What is the result of blocking each of the following dopaminergic pathways? So if you block the mesocortical pathway, you have an increase in the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, like social withdrawal and depression. If you block the mesolimbic pathway, you relieve the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. This is a pathway that you are targeting with neuroleptic drugs, your anti-schizophrenic drugs that are dopamine antagonists. And if you block the nigrostriatal pathway, it results in Parkinson disease. And stimulation of this pathway can result in extrapyramidal side effects. And if you block the last one here, the tubero-infundibular pathway, you will increase prolactin secretion from the anterior pituitary. This elevated prolactin causes hypogonadism, which manifests as amenorrhea in women and decreased libido in men. And then rarely it can cause gynecomastia and galactorrhea. Okay, that's it for this warm-up review. Let's move on to the lecture. In this video, we're going to review multiple myeloma, which I think is a fascinating disease. And it's probably a three or four star topic. And then we'll also discuss MGUS, which is sort of related to multiple myeloma. And we'll discuss myeloproliferative disorders, which are not related. Multiple myeloma is the most common tumor that arises within bone in people over about 50. So it's relatively common. Multiple myeloma is a malignancy of plasma cells. It's a monoclonal plasma cell cancer. Now, what are plasma cells? What do they do? Plasma cells are fully differentiated B cells whose job is to produce antibodies. So multiple myeloma is going to produce huge amounts of antibodies, usually IgG, sometimes IgA. This is a lymph node of a patient with multiple myeloma, and you'll notice that this node is just packed full of plasma cells. Remember, you can identify plasma cells by the little clumps of chromatin in the nuclei that give it what we call a clock face appearance. And then the cytoplasm just outside the nucleus is cleared out, and that's called the perinuclear Hof. Now there are lots of different facets to the clinical presentation of multiple myeloma, which is why I find it so interesting. So the four big clues for you in the initial history in labs would be anemia, renal insufficiency, back pain, and hypercalcemia. If you see any combination of those four things, especially in an older patient, you should at least entertain the possibility of multiple myeloma. Now to add a little more detail to that, these patients get anemia because all those plasma cells are packed into the bone marrow and they're interfering with the production of other cell lines. One reason they get renal insufficiency is that they're producing excessive antibodies, and those antibodies form casts in the urine, and they just kind of plug up the kidneys, and we call that myeloma kidney. It's not the only renal pathology you can get with myeloma, but just remember that they get this renal insufficiency. They, these patients get back pain, and they get hypercalcemia because the myeloma cells secrete cytokines called local osteolytic factors that stimulate osteoclasts and inhibit osteoblasts. There are also several findings related to the excessive monoclonal antibody production. So those antibodies are going to show up as a monoclonal antibody spike, or an M spike, when you do a serum protein electrophoresis. Again, this is monoclonal. It's one particular type of plasma cell is being replicated over and over and over, and so they're making very specific antibody. And then those, an uh, those immunoglobulin light chains are also going to spill into the urine, and we call that Bentz-Jones proteins. Make note of this. Even though you have these immunoglobulin light chains in your urine, on your analysis, you do not see elevated protein. On regular UA, you don't see elevated protein. To check for the presence of these Bentz-Jones proteins in the urine, you have to order a urine protein electrophoresis. Or sometimes we call that a UPEP. Now, myeloma patients have increased susceptibility to infection because even though they are making a ton of these IgG antibodies, they aren't necessarily the right antibodies. And they have decreased production of healthy lymphocytes and healthy granulocytes to fight infection. And then back in immunology, we mentioned that excessive antibody production for multiple myeloma can lead to one type of amyloidosis. Remember, amyloidosis is where you have deposition of excessive protein, and that protein coalesces into fibrils, and then it bulks up the tissue. So multiple myeloma can cause amyloid because of deposition of those immunoglobulin light chains. Then on x-ray, you can see punched out lytic bone lesions on the x-ray uh, due to those local osteolytic factors. So you might see an x-ray with lots of hypodense lesions that kind of make the bone look like Swiss cheese. Those are lytic lesions. That's a good diagnostic clue. And then on the peripheral smear, you're going to see the red blood cells stacked up like coins or like poker chips. And that's called a rouleau formation. Uh, that doesn't actually happen in vivo. It's just on the peripheral smear. 
You also need to be sure to distinguish multiple myeloma from Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. It's a very similar type of disease, but with Waldenstrom, you don't have those lytic bone lesions. And Waldenstrom causes a monoclonal proliferation of IgM. Myeloma is mainly IgG. With Waldenstrom, it's mainly IgM. And then Waldenstrom is also associated with amyloidosis and definitely with hyperviscosity, but no lytic lesions in the bones. I also want to mention a plasma cytoma, which is a solid tumor of plasma cells. There are actually two different types of plasma cytoma. There's a solitary plasma cytoma of the bone. There's also something called the extramedullary plasma cytoma. And one thing to know about the extramedullary plasma cytoma is that it has a predilection for the head and neck, especially the nose. So these are plasma cell tumors, and instead of being located in the bone, you might find them in the head and neck, specifically in the nose. And then again, plasma cytomas do not cause those lytic bone lesions. There's also a precursor to multiple myeloma called MGUS, or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. This is a monoclonal proliferation of plasma cells, producing lots and lots of monoclonal immunoglobulins, but without all those symptoms of multiple myeloma. There's no end organ damage yet. But MGUS can progress to full-blown myeloma, so these patients need to be closely monitored, and when they turn into myeloma, you have to start treatment. Next, let's talk about an unrelated group of disorders called myeloproliferative disorders. Myeloproliferative disorders are basically diseases where you have a neoplastic transformation of a single myeloid precursor, and then you have monoclonal proliferation of mature myeloid cells. And the three big ones to be familiar with are polycythemia vera, essential thrombocytosis, and myelofibrosis. Some people like to lump CML in there with the myeloproliferative disorders too because it's actually a neoplasm of mature myeloid cells. But again, these patients have had a neoplastic transformation of a myeloid precursor, and then it just keeps dividing and dividing forever, making more and more of whatever that cell line is. So these could be monocytes and neutrophils, it could be red cells, it could be platelets. These are all different cell types that are derived from those myeloid precursors. And these represent a broad spectrum of disease, and there's a lot of overlap between these. So you might just make one cell type, or you might make several different cell types. Now, we mentioned that CML is positive for the Philadelphia chromosome. Now, these other three tend to be positive for a mutation of a gene called JAK2, which encodes a protein called Janus kinase 2, and that's involved in hematopoietic growth factor signaling. So what happens is that a myeloid precursor cell acquires this JAK2 mutation so that the Janus kinase 2 protein is switched on all the time kind of like what we saw with the Philadelphia chromosome. It's just a different kinase signaling pathway. So these myeloid precursors have this switched on JAK2 kinase, and they think they're constantly getting a growth factor signal to make new red cells or make new platelets or whatever. So let's briefly look at these disorders one by one. Polycythemia vera is where you have that JAK2 mutation in a red cell precursor, so that it keeps making more and more red cells. It's, this is a benign neoplasm of red cells with out of control red cell production. When we talked about erythrocytosis before, I mentioned that polycythemia vera is characterized by an increased red cell mass without elevated erythropoietin. Now, you'd expect to have polycythemia if erythropoietin was elevated, but with low erythropoietin, that's kind of unusual to have a lot of red cells. Now, polycythemia vera is associated with findings of plethora, which is a reddening of the face, pruritus or itching after a hot bath or hot shower, splenomegaly, and hyperviscosity of the blood, because all those extra red cells make the blood hyperviscous and kind of sludgy. These patients can have headache due to sludging of the blood, and they also have a rare symptom called erythromyalgia, where the hands or feet get really red and swollen and painful because of sludging and clotting in the extremities. Now, essential thrombocytosis is basically the platelet equivalent of polycythemia vera. So instead of a lot of red cells, now you have a lot of megakaryocytes that are making platelets. So there's a platelet stimulating factor called thrombopoietin, kind of like erythropoietin, but it's thrombopoietin. And with essential thrombocytosis, your thrombopoietin level is also going to be low. Now in other diseases, you might have an elevated thrombopoietin level that causes thrombocytosis, but here thrombopoietin is low. Now these patients can have thrombosis because they have too many platelets, or they can have bleeding because the platelets they do have don't work correctly. And then myelofibrosis is where you have fibrosis, and obliteration of the marrow space. So if you're shown a picture of bone marrow infiltrated with adipocytes, we said that's aplastic anemia. But if you're shown a picture of a bone marrow that's infiltrated with fibrotic tissue, that's myelofibrosis. The name is very descriptive. And we said earlier that myelofibrosis causes teardrop-shaped red cells. Now it's time for the end of session quiz. So pause the video, work through those questions, then we'll go over the answers.
First question, what pathology best fits each of the following descriptions? Now, if you don't know anything else from this video, know these. Punched out lytic bone lesions are seen with multiple myeloma. Red cells clumped together like a stack of coins is the Rouleau formation, which is seen in multiple myeloma. Plethora plus pruritus plus headache is polycythemia vera. Back pain plus anemia plus renal insufficiency plus hypercalcemia is going to be multiple myeloma. Teardrop shaped red cells are seen in myelofibrosis and a monoclonal antibody spike is classically a feature of multiple myeloma, but it could also be MGUS or Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. And the last question, a patient with anemia, hypercalcemia, and bone pain undergoes a bone marrow biopsy, which reveals plasma cells. What's the diagnosis and what may be found on your analysis? So the diagnosis is multiple myeloma. That's pretty straightforward. But the tricky part of this question is that on routine urinalysis, you're not going to see proteinuria. The patient may have Bentz Jones proteins in the urine, but those don't show up as proteinuria on a routine urinalysis. But if you ordered a urine protein electrophoresis, that would show the monoclonal antibody spike. And that's it for this video. I'll see you next time.